Okay, so this is going to be the final uh, lecture for Unit 1, uh, subtitled The Religions of the Indian Subcontinent. And this is actually an optional portion of the course. If you're one of my students taking this class at Lone Star or HCC or another university or college, uh, you can skip this if you want and move on to Unit 1 and do Shinto instead. Or you can do this one and skip Shinto. It's up to you. Um, and so, you know, really, you know, maybe just look them up on Wikipedia and, you know, read a general overview and whichever one interests you the most, uh, pick that one. Uh, I, I added Sikhism. This is the first time I've been, uh, I've taught it, uh, teaching this class. So I'm pretty green when it comes to this material, I have to admit. I feel the least confident and I feel like I have the least amount of authority to, to talk about Sikhism. So I'm going to try to keep it really brief and just, you know, keep it to the basics and not embellish too much. Because as I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not that much of an expert in this one, much less so than any of these other traditions. However, this one, this tradition, Sikhism, um, is one of the fifth, it's the fifth largest religion in the world, according to some accounts. Uh, your textbook says that. I've, I've, you know, I've read elsewhere, Baha'i, but, you know, uh, let's, you know, it's big, right? It's much bigger than Shinto. And so Shinto was something that I wanted to keep because I thought unit two was too short. You know, it was, you know, just Taoism and Confucianism. And I felt like that wasn't rounded enough for a full unit. So I added Shinto. But as I, I think I've um, mentioned in earlier videos, already earlier lectures, that Shinto is fading, it seems. There's less and less followers each year. Um, and it's becoming less of a religion and more of just like a cultural tradition, it seems. Uh, and Sikhism is actually uh, the opposite. It's on the rise. So, uh, you know, so there's large communities of Sikhism, not just in India, you know, so again, this is uh, religions of the Indian subcontinent. Okay, so uh, the uh, the tradition that we that, that's known as Sikhism uh, originated in the Punjabi region. We'll talk more about that towards the end of this lecture. Uh, but there are large communities of Sikhs outside of India. You know, you've got them in the UK, Canada, uh, United States, Malaysia, Singapore, and it's not a religion. It's 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 much like similar to Islam. It doesn't look to convert people. It doesn't seek converts, or it doesn't actively do this. And most Sikhs don't think of their faith as just some uh, sectarian religion. So they share that with Hinduism. Uh, they think that their path is just one expression of the universal truth that you can find in every religion. So there's some universalism, uh, some elements of Hindu, and then some uh, elements of Islam with the idea that, well, I guess also um, Hindu, you might argue some versions of it are like this non-sectarian. Um, so the tradition of Sikhism begins with the Sants, okay? Who were the Sants? Um, the Sants were known as these holy people. Uh, the term Sikh, okay, oh, before I get to the Sant tradition, let's talk about the, the term itself. It means disciple or student or, or literally seekers of truth, right? So Sikhs are the followers of, of the tradition and Sants, again, are the holy holy people. And these would include, in the tradition, they recognize Sufi mystics. So from the Islamic tradition, we'll talk about Sufism when we get to Islam, sort of mystical tradition within Islam, and also some of the Hindu bhaktas. We talked about bhakti yoga as this devotional path. So some of these bhakta saints in Hindu are also, or, or, or Sri, the, the saints, are, are uh, included here in the holy people of the tradition. Uh, and many of these came from the lower castes. Um, of, of, of Hinduism, um, and they emphasize devotion over ritualism. So devotion, your inner spiritual um, disposition over your outer actions and going through ritual movements and things like this. Um, it's very popular. This is very popular in Northern India, uh, and, and, and many sants were bridges between Hinduism and Islam. So a lot of times you'll hear Sikhism as referred to as a, a mix between Islam and Hinduism, but many Sikhs find that offensive, right? So the, we're our own tradition. Uh, and, and really, maybe that's anachronistic because the, during the time period when this tradition started, the term Hinduism hadn't even really been invented yet. Um, 
So, um, according to some legends, there was this weaver, Kabir. Uh, you know, he's the sort of ancient sage, and he was the son of Muslim parents, but also a disciple of the Hindu guru, uh, Ramananda. Uh, Ramananda Raya, there's pictured on the right. So he uh, apparently highlighted a, uh, again, a devotion to God, you know, a, an inner spiritual and enlightened devotion to God over sectarian ritualism, over, you know, Brahmanism versus the, the earlier Vedic tradition versus Muslim versus this or that, you know, which path is right. Um, and really the history of all this stuff is a matter of scholarly debate. So everything that I say in this video, obviously, and, and, and this is probably true of most of these traditions, when we're talking about their most important and holy figures, a lot of this stuff is, is wrapped up in, in, in uh, tradition and it's been passed on orally and a lot of it isn't really documented historically. Um, so again, there's a lot of scholarly debate. Um, the whole Sant, the whole Sant movement, really, uh, uh, you know, including the life of Kabir here. Um, it's also worth noting that this this idea of Hinduism and Islam uh, were were drawing together prior to the life of Guru Nanak. Okay, so Nanak, he's the one that founds the the tradition. So again, it's kind of problematic. The the notion of Hinduism uh, itself wasn't even a thing till the Brits come in, and that's not till you know the nineteenth century. So I just mentioned Guru Nanak. Um, so Nanak, he lived between 1469 and 1539, born in the Punjab, Punjab region, uh, that's Northwestern India. Uh, and, and this, this is a route that is sort of an entrance into India, right? It's, it's on, it's on the outskirts of the country, right? So all these outside invaders kind of have to go through this mountainous region to get to India. And, um, so the idea is, you know, typically this region is very warlike, it's, it's very dangerous, and those that have been lived there and inhabited it are, are these strong and mighty and noble warriors. That's sort of the, the, the stereotype, for lack of a better word. Um, so it was a home to both Muslims and Hindus uh, by this time period. And the stories that we have of the Guru Nanak that survive are known as John of Sakis or literally birth witnesses. These are a couple, um, I, I guess, lithographs of scenes from his life. Right, the one on the left is him taking some uh, mythical pralada, uh, you know, and, and, and then the second one, he's entering the Grand Mosque of Mecca with his feet pointing towards the Kaaba. Uh, and this, this is sort of seen as very, uh, blasphemous right the kaaba is a holy site in islam and he points his feet towards the kaaba so someone comes up to him and chastises him for it and he says well you know show me somewhere where god isn't you know as you know the idea is that god is everywhere so you know I, if i don't point my feet at the kaaba i have to point them at the ground and god's there too so what am i to do right um again these are these are written down in the, about the 17th century we think and they reflect events that the believers think are very important, uh, miracles of uh, Guru Nanak's life, but they're not necessarily historically verifiable, like, like many of the founders of these traditions that we're gonna study. In fact, all of them, I can't think of one tradition where they actually, I mean, maybe Islam would be the closest, but obviously the Hadith, the stories of, of, of Muhammad's life, there are different versions of Hadith, right? So e even that's disputable, but I would say that the closest thing to historical account of any of the founders we have is Islam. Um, I mean, then it comes later, right? So I guess he's probably on par with, 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 um, with Islam. But like I said earlier, I'm not a big expert on this tradition. So I don't want to, I, I don't want to say anything with super confidence about this. Um, so again, this, this, this Guru Nanak who starts the faith, he's born in the, in the Northwestern uh, province of, of Punjab. Uh, the stories of his life, uh, are called Janam Sakis and he's, said to have been a very contemplative person from, from, from his childhood, that he just had this sort of intellectual nature, but he wasn't an ascetic, okay? So this is something that's, I, I think, key here. Sikhism and, and, and Nanak himself, apparently, they, they wanna separate themselves from that path in Hinduism of pure asceticism. 
you know, he married, he worked as an accountant and he focused also on spiritual practice. So he didn't think that one had to separate oneself from the community, separate oneself from society. In fact, quite the opposite. That's a part of one's duties. So once he became about 30 years old, apparently he has this, according to legends, this, uh, this transformative experience when he goes to the river and immerses himself for several days and he re-emerges unharmed and glowing with this radiance. According to some legends, he was taken into the direct presence of God. He had this mystical experience. Now, Sikh legend reports that at this point, he began traveling and teaching and arguing about distinctions between the Hindu tradition and the Muslim tradition and arguing that these distinctions were completely unimportant. And like many of the earlier sants, you know, these holy men we talked about like Kabir, um, like many of these, he mocked all the ritual practices of Hindus and Muslim and, and emphasized in, instead this fervent devotion to God. He taught three central concepts, really, were his sort of teachings. First one is hard work. You know, get a job, basically. Don't be lazy. Work hard to earn your living. Don't withdraw from society. That's misspelled there. Um, Sorry, Mr. Withdrawal. withdraw. Uh, but yeah, you have to with, uh, don't don't just withdraw like one of the sannyasins in the Hindu tradition or some ascetic monk. You need to spend your life working hard and earning your living. And once you do this, you also have to, if you're successful and you earn more than you need to live, you need to share your wealth with those who need uh, help. And the third teaching, since so these basic teachings of Guru and it is you have to remember God's name at all times. So one big part of, of Sikh practice is the chanting of God's name, Nam, and other names for him. Uh, and so this is a part of it. Always remember God, always thank God. God is always responsible for all that is good. And so one must always remember that and count one's blessings. Um, so he eventually settled with his family as a farmer. And his followers are now known, um, as we said, as Sikhs, right? So remember that that's a, a seeker of truth, um, a devotee. Um, now, I've heard people pronounce it sick. So again, I'm very, I'm not very confident about this, right? I've met Sikhs and they say Sikh. I've seen documentaries on Sikhism and they say Sikh. I've had professors say Sikhism, but I've heard people in the news and reporters say Sikh or Sikhism. Um, and you know, every Sikh I've ever met, they're so darned polite and they're so nice and such really friendly people that I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Maybe it is pronounced Sikh. Your textbook I think has, it, it has in parentheses, you know, that it's sick. It rhymes with thick, I think is what she says. But um, I don't know if she does say that in the textbook, but, uh, you know, uh, I've, I'm not really sure. Again, if there's any Sikhs out there who are watching this video on YouTube, I would love it if you just put it in the comments, maybe like put an end to this debate. Um, but anyways, I don't think it's that important, honestly, right? So I'm going to keep saying Sikh because that's what I'm used to. It's going to slip me up if I keep trying to correct myself. So I really apologize if I'm mispronouncing Sikhism as Sikhism. But that, this is just what I've sort of been conditioned. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure if you're actually a Sikh, you're, you're such a nice, understanding, compassionate person, probably, that you probably would be okay with it. <laughs> okay, so now that that's on, on the table, I can sort of pr proceed, I think, with more confidence. Okay, so again, uh, th these are Sikhs, disciples, seekers, uh, um, uh, seekers of truth. Um, and they are all a part of this community, right? Um, they contribute to a community kitchen. They serve food without recognizing caste distinctions. And there, the legend is that when Nanuk died, um, his Hindu and Muslim followers argued over um, who would dispose of his body, right? And um, there, they, uh, there's a legend that they covered his body up and he said, look, put flowers, all the Muslim uh, followers put the flowers on one side of my body and all the Hindu followers put flowers on my, the other side of my body. And then, you know, cover it with a sheet and then come back the next day and then cremate me. And the flowers that are uh, still fresh and bloom, you know, that haven't wilted, you know, like the, uh, that's the right side. So it was a big trick, basically. The next day they come and they remove the sheet and 
all the flowers are just fine. They're, none of them have wilted. They're all completely blossomed, but his body has disappeared. It, you know, his spiritual essence has, you know, evaporated into the ether or something like this. And so, again, uh, uh, an emphasis on non-sectarianism. You know, all these different paths are, uh, they're, they're equally valid. It's really all about your inner disposition, your care, your love, your devotion to God. Um, so after he dies, there are, there's a succession of nine gurus, and your textbook goes through all of them. The tenth one, Gobind Sin, is, is kind of seen as the last, um, and, and we're briefly going to cover them. I'm not going to go through all of them. The textbook, uh, Living Religions, we're working with the tenth edition here, uh, has a lot more information about them, but I'm just, again, going over sort of the basics. This is just a very short unit on Sikhism. So the, the nine gurus after Nanak were understood to be able to transmit his spiritual light. Um, and he designated Angad, Guru Angad, as, the, as his successor. Okay, so Angad continues this tradition um, of the community kitchen, uh, which is known as a langur. Okay, that's, that's one of the, 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 the terms in your textbook, one of the vocabulary words. Uh, so this kitchen, again, is, is, is a big part of or the kitchen and the feeding, the, 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 the community meal uh, is a big part of the Sikh tradition. In fact, when I first took a class in Eastern religions, when I was an undergraduate, um, one of our assignments was to go and visit a temple, um, you know, a gurdwara, a, a, a synagogue, a church, a cathedral, whatever, pick a place to go and visit it just to see. Uh, and I think our instructor encouraged us to try to go at a time when they had some ritual going on or some service going on. And one of our students, I didn't go to a Gurdwara, but one of our students went to a Sikh temple and actually took part in one of these meals. And he said it was a very great experience. He felt all, he was, he, he felt quite at home. They're very welcoming. You know, you walk into the building and he said that they're very open. They're very friendly. Uh, they made him, you know, he had to wear one of these, um, um, oh geez, <laughs> what's the word? Um, a turban. He had to wear a turban. Sorry. Uh, uh, he had to wear a turban. You know, that's part of their tradition. You have to have your hair covered if you're male. So, you know, they actually put it on for him. They had one for him and they helped him with it on. And once he had his turban, they let him sit down and they, you know, they let him take part of this, this, this meal. So again, the, the meals, that's the long art. And this was, these were thought to have been established uh, by Nanak and it continued by Angad. Okay. So the third and the fourth uh, gurus are Amar Das and Ram Das. Um, they were thought to have actually established the city of Amritsar, where the, uh, now this is a picture from a Diwali celebration in the city of Amritsar in India. Um, and the fifth guru, Arjun Dev, built the Golden Temple, which is uh, uh, pictured here. This is the Golden uh, Temple in, in, in Amritsar. Uh, the Golden Temple is, is the most sacred shrine in all of Sikh uh, tradition. Uh, and this fifth guru, Ar, 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 Arjun uh, Dev, did I have a picture of Arjun Dev? I guess I did it. Thought I did. Uh, well, I guess I didn't. So Ar, Arjun Dev, and I don't have a slide for him, my apologies. Uh, Arjun Dev, again, this is the uh, sixth um, I'm sorry, the fifth uh, guru, and he's the one that builds the, the city, he uh, builds the shrine, and he also compiles the um, Adi Granth, okay, and the, the Adi Granth is, oh, oh sorry, Ram Das. I already have, I did have a picture of him, right, um, sorry, I'm getting really mixed up here, I'm, oh, I see what it is, my notes are totally screwed up, sorry. Uh, Ram Das is the one uh, who established the city. The fifth guru uh, is the one who, uh, Arjun Dev, the one I don't have a picture for, he's the one that built the holy temple, the golden temple, and he also um, uh, compiled the teachings of Sikhism into the sacred book, the Adi Granth. Uh, the Adi Granth, our original holy book, uh, which would later become known as the Guru Granth Sahib. We'll talk more about that later. Um, 
it includes all the teachings of Sikhism as, you know, brought, you know, as, as passed on from Nanak. Um, and also when, when it becomes the Guru Granth Sahib, again, more on that later, this includes uh, other compositions by later Gurus. Um, this can, this uh, has hymns, a lot of hymns by the Sikh Gurus, as well as some of the earlier Hindu and Muslim saints, including Kabir, the original, right, sort of the the, the, the pre-founder, I guess you could say. Uh, and Arjun Dev, uh, again, not pictured here. I've got Ram Das instead. I don't know what I was thinking when I, I made this uh, slideshow. Uh, Arjun Dev was actually executed, right? He was violently executed by a Mughal emperor. And this is sort of the beginning of what so many people say is when, when, when Sikhism starts to become a more militaristic religion. And that's what it's kind of known for today, that the Sikhs uh, especially the pure, the, the Khalsa, the holy ones, they're, they're seen as these brave, uh, very fierce warriors. So again, the Adi Granth, this is a picture of a copy of an ancient um, um, copy of the Adi Granth, which again, people think contains teachings of the Kabir, this early Sant. And this version here, actually very controversially, the British Museum has a copy of it. And, you know, like many other things, many artifacts at the British Museum, they have it and the people that originally owned it in the Punjab want it back. Okay, so, um, but here's a picture of one of the eight ancient scriptures of the Sikh tradition, right, with a, a page open here with the uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, writing. So again, um, Arjun Dev, who I unfortunately don't have any picture of, was assassinated. He was followed by Hargobind. Okay, so Hargobind is, is the sixth guru, and he established a Sikh army. Uh, he carries around two swords. Here we have him only pictured with one sword. But one of them was supposed to symbolize temporal, temporal power, right? The, the power of here and now, the, the power of the world, worldly power. The other power, uh, the other sword symbolizes spiritual power. The seventh guru, uh, Harai, which, you know, comes after Hargaman, he was a pacifist, so quite opposite of, of Hargaman. He advocated service towards humanity. Now, the eighth guru was very young. He was only eight years old, um, I believe, when he became uh, the guru. Um, so he was or actually eight, age five. He died at age eight. He only lived to be a guru for three years. Uh, and there's one story, one legend of him where he touches this servant uh, with a cane and the servant starts to... Uh, to recite these spiritual truths from the Adi Granth. And I guess this story is supposed to uh, be another symbol of the non-sectarian nature of Sikhism, right? Even this servant was able to speak spiritual truth. Har Krishnan was, you know, touching him with his wisdom and showing that, you know, even this man can, you know, even this man is holy. Forget the caste system. That's not what's important. What you can learn from the inner truth and the, the inner beauty of the person, not their outer caste distinctions, their societal uh, caste distinctions. Okay, so after uh, Har Krishna, we get uh, the Guru Teg Bhadur. Uh, he's the one that precedes him. He's the ninth Guru. He was martyred. Um, according to Sikh tradition, he came to the aid of Hindus who were facing a forced conversion to Islam. And despite rejecting Hindu religious belief and practice, he actually defended religious freedom. This is something that um, in general Sikhs claim to uphold. Maybe they don't always do it in practice, but that's one of the tenets of their religion, even in India today, with a lot of the political factions that go on between some of these traditions. Um, they always claim to be for religious freedom. Even if they were rulers, they would say, you know, you got to let the Muslims be Muslims, Hindus be Hindus. You can't, you know, force people to do this. They have to come to it of their own volition, uh, I suppose, is the idea. Uh, but as I said, this this is the the, the guru, uh, Tegh Bahadur, the ninth guru. So sort of, you know, the last of the famous, you know, the, the line of the nine gurus. Uh, and again, he's martyred uh, for, for coming to the aid of the Hindu, Hindus. He's imprisoned by a Mughal emperor, uh, Aurangzeb, uh, ugh, I can't say his name, Aurangzeb, uh, and then publicly executed. So after he dies, uh, the 10th guru, Gobind Singh, who's a very important guru, he's not considered sort of the nine successive gurus after Nanak, uh, he's, the, he's the sort of the 10th, um, 
he's the son of Tag Bahadur. And so it's not really clear that he uh, is really the 10th guru or just the son of the ninth. Uh, depends on who you talk to, I suppose. But he called his followers to a special assembly, apparently, in 1699 and asked for five volunteers willing to offer their heads, you know, willing to die to protect their religious ideals. And each of the five was taken into a tent one by one to fight him, right? And apparently, you know, they, they all came out uh, sh shortly afterwards with a bloody sword. Um, some accounts say that the blood came from a goat, that he was just faking. He didn't really uh, kill them or behead them or anything like that. Uh, but some accounts say that he beheaded them and then resurrected them. And um, other, uh, other accounts also talk about his wife, who's pictured here with him, that she mixed in some blood uh, into this uh, sacred drink, the Amrit, and they, they took this, this drink uh, and that, that, that blood that she mixed in was to sweeten the elixir, to make them not just fierce, but also merciful, right? A little bit of mercy uh, um, thrown in, okay? So Gobind Sin is, 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 is the one who is said to have established this, this ritual, this rite of initiation uh, using the Amrit, right? This, this water basically stirred with a double-edged sword uh, to make the Sikh heroes. Uh, and it's mixed with sugar to make them compassionate. So uh, uh, Gobind Sin was the first to initiate uh, what was known as, the, who were known as the five beloved ones. They're pictured here, like the five beloved ones. Uh, and he had, them in, uh, he had them initiate him, right? They did the same thing to him. And if you undergo this ritual today, right, they still do this in, in Sikh practice. Um, the idea is once you do this, you become a Singh or a lion. Or if you're a woman and you do this, you become a car or a princess. The people who become a part of this, they form the Khalsa. The Khalsa are the pure ones, right? This, the pure ones. Um, and again, the first five were known as the five beloved ones. So the um, Dasam Granth is also something that is associated with, Go with, the, uh, with Gobind Singh. I'm not gonna say much about it, but it's, it's another spiritual text within uh, Sikhism. So the main one is the Adi Granth. Uh, that's the original one, uh, the original holy book. But the Dasam Granth was thought to have been compiled by, by um, uh, Gobind Singh. Uh, so not only did he establish this ritual of Amrit uh, you know, and the Khalsa, the pure ones, but he also was said to have compiled this, this book here, which many um, Sikhs debate over whether it's authentic, whether some of it's authentic, but other, you know, so it has a lot of controversial stuff in it, like some pretty explicitly erotic stuff, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of profanity. So, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's pretty controversial within the tradition. Some accept it, some don't. Um, so more about the Khalsa, right? Uh, in your textbook, they talk about the five Ks. Uh, and here I have, they don't give you all the term, like what the K stand for, right? The Kanga, this is the comb, uh, you know, keep your hair in place. The Kara is the wristband. The Kesh uh, is, uh, you know, that you don't, you never cut your, your uh, hair, right? The Kirpan is the sword uh, and the Kashara are, are these uh, britches that you wear, right? So um, you, again, you have to have this uncut hair worn under a turban. Uh, a comb to keep your hair tidy, a steel bracelet, a drawstring of under breeches, and a sword. Women have to adopt some of the five symbols, but they typically don't have to wear a turban. And there's many interpretations. Um, I mean, I've, obviously, this, this uh, chart that I found has uh, some explanations for it. Uh, but there's many interpretations of the significance of the 5Ks, especially uh, this is really important that the... Uh, Uniform symbols, they indicate a spirit of equality among Sikhs, regardless of caste or social economic status, right? So regardless of how poor or rich you are, you can become a Khalsa. Uh, and it, the sword's often a metaphor for design of wisdom, and it cuts through ignorance and egocentrism. So the uh, Sikh tradition also uh, records uh, that the... Um, the tenth guru, Gobind Singh, also established a very strict moral code for the Khalsa. 
so this isn't true of all followers. Not all Sikhs have to do this, but they, they can't use tobacco. Obviously, they can't commit adultery. No consumption of meat that is slaughtered in the Muslim fashion that's uh, bled slowly. Um, they can't eat meat that's been slaughtered in that way. Um, and when the, uh, the uh, guru, Kok Gobinson, dies, he basically declares that the line of gurus is over. And he says basically that the book itself is the guru. So he, again, declares an end to the human succession of gurus and says that the guru's authority would, would thereafter reside in the, uh, the Adi Granth. Remember, that's the original holy book, but now it's known as the Guru Granth Sahib. Okay, so this is um, central, a central part of Sikh practice, is reading and reciting passages from the Guru Granth Sahib. Uh, once the Sikhs started to gain political power, um, you know, there's a lot of things they talk about in the textbook and a lot of inner fighting that I'm going to skip over, but they're conquered eventually. So they, they actually take control of this region, the Punjab region, uh, where, where this faith originates. But, are, but once the Brits come in in 1849, uh, this starts to change and they're a big part of the... British, this, this independence from Britain movement in India. So I'm not going to get into that. There's so much to it, but I mean, I hate to do this, but you know, your textbook, again, if you're interested in this, your textbook talks a lot more about it. There's at least two or three good paragraphs on the kind of struggle. I've always uh, heard, at least maybe this is because I'm a child of the 80s, that the British, you know, when they were still in India, before, before the in India gained independence, towards the very end, they would actually hire Sikhs as bodyguards. But your textbook tells another story, that the Sikhs were actually a part of the Indian independence movement and fought against the British. So, again, I don't want to comment too much on this. I'm no expert at all in this tradition, as you could probably tell by the... Um, uh, hesitance in my in my voice. Um, so um, one little note about uh, women in in the Sikh tradition: uh, they have a they have their free to participate, but it's typically been men who read from this book, so they can participate in the services. But usually, when you see recitings, it's the men that are doing the recitings. Um, I mentioned, uh, oh, and these are Gurdwaras, or Gur, sorry, Gurdwaras. That's the Sikh term for what we would call a temple. Uh, you, know, the, you know, in fact, in America, they'll call them Sikh temples. Even Sikhs will call them temples. But the term really is Gurdwara. So here's a few images of Gurdwaras. You know, there's the inside of, of what will typically look like. Um, and the, uh, the Sikhs, like I said earlier, much like the Islamic tradition, they're not supposed to convert their followers. They're not or they're supposed to go look and convert people to their tradition. You're supposed to find it yourself. Uh, you know, they'll take people in. If you want to convert, they're very happy to, but they don't proselytize. Um, but this dasis, okay, the, the journeys of Nanak uh, were thought to have established Sikhism throughout the world, right? That he spread his teachings. And his son, Bobby Srivshan, helped also spread the message of Sikhism. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, uh, especially here in Houston, where I live, right, there's a lot of Sikhs uh, and, uh, you know, throughout the country, really. I mean, there, you know, there was a, a shooting we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin. Jeez, I'm horrible. Yes, in Wisconsin. Uh, it was a long time ago and there's been so many shootings since there. I'm sorry. I didn't remember when and where it was. Um, so again, the teachings were, were thought to have been spread by Udasis, by this journey, this movement of Nanak. Okay. So the major focus again of Sikhism is devotion, devotion to God. This is the big emphasis. This I think is the, the, the part of Sikhism that is very similar to Islam. It's all about God and the focus is God. It's all central, right? The one God. And they think that their God is the same God that's worshipped under many different names around the world. So you know, they, in a sense, they're very universalistic and inclusive. Uh, you know, all these other faiths, they may think they're different, but really they're all, they're all worshipping Nam. That's the name of God in the Sikh 
tradition. So they often refer to God also as Sat, which means literally truth, or Ik Onkar, which means the one supreme being. Uh, during their practices of devotion, they'll often ch chant the Mul Mantra. This is a basic sacred chant that's at the beginning of the, uh, the Granth Sahib, the Guru Granth Sahib, and also the Jap Sahib. This is uh, uh, opens uh, with a similar series from uh, of descriptions uh, very similar to the mole mantra that also prays this formless God. It's part of the text uh, we were talking about earlier, the Dasam Granth, uh, which is the second most important spiritual text in uh, the Sikh tradition. So again, according to uh, the, the Sikh belief, God's light shines through the gurus and especially through the Guru Granth Sahib, the book, uh, and indeed through all creation, through all that is, the entire universe. Uh, God's light shines through everything. Um, and so God's name, Nam, dwells in all. And I guess that with, with the Hindu belief system, the Sikhs also share the notion of karma and reincarnation. I feel like we've talked about that enough in this course. If we, you don't have an idea of karma, then go back and review the uh, series on Hindu and Jainism and Buddhism. And hopefully by then you will have a, a clearer understanding of the notion of karma. Similar thing here, reincarnation. The ultimate goal though, it's not release from samsara, but instead a, a oneness with the divine, becoming one with God. Perhaps that's really what the Hindus are looking for, but but they put it in terms of release, moksha, and so do so do the Buddhists. It's it's nirvana, and so do the Jainists. You know, you reach Kabbalah, right? You're 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 released from the cycle. It's an escape. But but this is more an emphasis on becoming one. Um, but of course, you know, to be fair to those traditions I just mentioned, it's all about becoming one. That's how you do. That's how you achieve release. Is seeing, is letting go of your ego, becoming one with the universe. The Muslim mystic Myanmar, he was thought to have uh, placed the first cornerstone on the Golden Temple. Uh, and the Golden Temple itself has four doors facing four directions. And this is supposed to symbolize uh, that this system is open to all castes, all faiths, anybody that wants to worship in the Sikh temple can. Uh, and this has become controversial, actually. Recently, um, they've become, some Sikh temples will not allow non-Sikhs in uh, for reasons of, you know, for safety reasons, I think, because of some of sectarian violence. Um, but it doesn't acknowledge traditional, the traditional caste system. I feel like I've said this enough times, but I, I don't know why I keep repeating myself. It's in my notes here. Um, seva, S-E-V-A, or service, Seva, service, this is their word for service. Uh, that's highly valued. And uh, you know, what you do to be a good Sikh is to serve your community. And, ser and by serving the community, you serve God. And this is especially practiced uh, by Seva Pontus. I thought I had a... Uh, a slide for the save upon this. All right. Well, anyways, I don't, so I'm just, I'm going to move on. Um, so again, the Sikhs are supposed to recognize God in the world through their work, uh, through their worship, and also through giving, right? Through charity. And the ego, again, is considered, like in many of these traditions so far, it's considered a big obstacle to God realization. Um, and many women are thought to have been respected uh, in the tradition and even a belief to defend their faith, right? So there's actually a tradition of some women becoming warriors in Sikh armies and disguising themselves as men, right? Again, I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of details that are in the textbook, but I'm, tr I'm trying to wrap up this video to keep it short. Um, let me see here. I don't want to skip anything really, really important uh, for my students so that, you know, they can do good on their quiz. Um, Still, it seems like there's a preference of sons over daughters, but in 2001, the chief authorities in the Sikh uh, tradition, the Sikh faith, they issued an order that uh, that female feticide was uh, was a crime worthy of being excommunicated. So if you try to, you know, get rid of a woman or a, a, a female daughter, uh, which is a practice that was common in some of these countries, uh, you know, at some point, uh, that that was just one of the most heinous crimes and that you'd be excommunicated. Um, back to this notion of, you know, righteous war that was, you could say, developed by Gobind Sindh, right? The, 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 uh, the, uh, the 10th guru, 
uh, you know, he's not the first warlike guru. Hargobin was the first warlike guru, but Gobind Sen for sure, he's, he sort of set out these disciplinary rules for the Khalsa, the pure ones. And um, where was I? Sorry, I'm, I lost my spot here. He developed five conditions for what a righteous war would be. Um, so this kind of reminds me if, if anyone's familiar with uh, the just war theory of Thomas Aquinas, if you've ever taken a class in medieval philosophy or you studied St. Thomas Aquinas, you might be familiar with just war theory. So he's a Christian and he was writing during the Crusades and he was trying to figure out, well, are we supposed to kill people? It seems kind of like Christianity should be pacifist. So he was trying to come up with a way to justify war using scripture, but I'll, I'll probably cover that when we get to Christianity. But for, for Gobind Sin, he says that there are there are conditions for right what he called righteous war the first one is that the military means may be used only as a last resort so you've tried diplomacy and it didn't work uh the battle has to be conducted without enmity or desire for revenge so you're not doing it because you want to get back at somebody um territory shouldn't be taken or captured uh uh property has to be uh, given back if it's stolen, right? We might take it during war, but once the war's over, we give back property uh, to, to the people that it originally belonged to. The troops have to be committed to the cause. You can't just hire mercenaries to do it, but they actually have to want to fight. Uh, and, they, and the troops can't smoke, they can't drink, um, they can't abuse the opponent's women, right? If they, they take over a village, they can't start, you know, abusing the women of, of the conquered. And uh, they have to use the minimal amount of force, no hostilities. Uh, and as soon as the hostilities uh, are ending, uh, are ended, uh, and the objective is obtained, then, then there's really no justification for war, right? And we have to sort of go back to and just like forgive and forget. Um, so some of the sacred practices, right? We have some pictures here of a Sangha, which is, you know, that's, that's the congregation. Um, that's the word for congre I guess for congregation, all the people assembled here. <clears throat> some of the some of the practices of, of Sikhism, as you might have gathered from what I've already said, is a constant repetition of God's name, an inner repetition of God's name or names, different names of God. Uh, people who are initiates of the Khalsa, right, the pure ones. They have to, of course, abstain from drugs, alcohol, tobacco. We already mentioned that. Um, the pure ones also have to vanquish the five evils of lust, anger, greed, attachment, and ego. Remember, not all of the the uh, um, the Sikhs are Khalsa. Um, of course, we mentioned the longer uh, already. That's the the group, the communal meal, the communal kitchen, and uh, all the people that go to the Gurdwara, right? The building where where the uh, where the uh, the sacred shrine, where the holy book is is kept, and where where all the the rituals are practiced. Uh, when you enter into that, um, there's no priestly class, okay? So even if you're one reciting the Khalsa, you're not supposed to be thought of as anything better than anybody else, right? Everyone's supposed to be on an equal level. Um, so there's no, there's no caste separation in worship, although the men and women are kept sec separate, um, just like, I guess that's sort of Hindu custom, uh, and it's also Sikh custom, that when, when the women and men, when m women and men worship, they have to be kept in um, a separate part or partition of, of the uh, Gurdwara. Um, they're encouraged to donate a certain percentage of their income. I think it's 10% of their income to community welfare. And um, they always have morning prayers and evening prayers, very similar to Islam, but Islam yet even more, like five prayers a day. Um, so many of the hymns, right, these devotional hymns of the Grant Sahib are chanted or they're sung. And when they do this, this is known as kirtan, right? When they sing it with a sort of musical celebration and, and recital of the Guru Granth, uh, uh, Guru Granth Sahib, uh, it's placed on a platform and there's a whisk that might be waved over it. And when there's special occasions, uh, Sikhs might even commission uh, an Akan path or a continuous reading of the entire text, right? Like a celebration where they read the whole thing from beginning to end. Um, some Gurdwaras, like the Golden Temple in Amritsar, like the, the holy site, the most important one, they've, they've traditionally only allowed men to read publicly again. Uh, but in 1996, there was a central body regulating Gurdwaras that ruled that women should be allowed to read publicly um, as well. Um, 
So this is a, a, a map of the Pujam re region. It remains really the heart of Sikhism, although this, this is a, this region of the, the, the Indian subcontinent it was partitioned when the British left India in 1947. So two thirds of the Punjab went to Pakistan and many Sikhs living there at the time migrated to the Indian side of the Punjab and, and also other parts of the world. Uh, and there was a lot of violence, a lot of hardship, right? There's still, you might say, a lot of animosity and a lot of tension in this region. Um, so even though relations, I, I guess you could say between Sikhs and Hindus have generally been good, there's, there's often been violent clashes. More on this in the book. Um, and there's a lot of great information, by the way, on Sikhism on the internet. There's a Sikhnet.com and there's, uh, I think it's uh, Wikiseek.com uh, or something like that. It's a Wikipedia made by, it's it made by actual, uh, you know, a Sikh organization. So I'm pretty sure that the, the information is about as accurate as you're going to get. So if you want to know more about this tradition, certainly this video is not the place to, to go. It's the place to start just to get a general overview and an idea of what this tradition is all about. But I wouldn't be surprised if my own notes are filled with slight inaccuracies. So take it as it is, okay? So again, the, this region here too, um, it's still a pretty uh, disputed territory. And there are many like separatists within the Sikh tradition uh, who want a, an independent state in this region for Sikhs. And they want it to be known as Khalistan. Um, the prime minister of India, uh, in the 1980s, Indira Gandhi, she attacked the Golden Temple in 1984 when there were militants thought to be using it as a shelter. And several months later, she was assassinated by her Sikh bodyguards. And, and there was a big retribution. Uh, uh, all these riots claimed lives of thousands of Sikh throughout India. So through the 80s, um, there were many Sikhs in the Pujami that just disappeared like mysteriously, allegedly at the hands of police and separatists. Uh, so in recent years, this violence has kind of abated, but obviously, uh, you know, it's, it hasn't ended. There's still a little bit of tension there, uh, not just between the Sikhs and the Hindus, but the Muslims and the Hindus. And there's a rise of the Hindu nationalist movement with, with, with Prime Minister Modi, if you keep up with the news. And we already talked about this a little bit in the uh, Hindu video series. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and move on and, and I'll leave it at that here. Um, but as I said, within the community itself, within the Sikh community itself, um, there's been uh, debates, right? You can go online and read. I, I, as I was looking for some of these images, you can find some blogs where Sikhs will debate, you know, some of the meanings of the, the Guru, uh, Guru um, uh, Grand Sahib, uh, and also whether or not the uh, the uh, the second text, the uh, geez, I always forget the name of it. Sorry, I got to cheat here. The uh, Dasam Garant is you know how 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 um, how key it is, if at all, to the Sikh tradition. Okay, so um, there's also a lot of disputes in the community about leadership. Uh, there's contributions controversies over the self-styled gurus uh, or saints who try to antagonize mainstream Sikhs who believe that that uh, there's no worldly gurus. Okay, so you've got all these people coming up, no, no, there are worldly gurus, it's not just the book. So you've got stuff like that. There's also debates over power and authority within Sikhism. Um, there's a tradition that's developed where there's these leaders are what are called Jafidars of the five historic Gurdwaras. The, there's a tradition that they, they're allowed to issue directives for all Sikhs. They're almost like the five popes of Sikhism, but some Sikhs don't believe this, right? They think it's contrary to the democratic spirit of the tradition. So there's a tension uh, that exists between those who favor emphasizing this sort of, I guess, ecumenical character um, of Sikhism that sort of allows an opening for all belief systems and those who prefer to focus more rigidly on Sikhism as its own uh, distinct identity and to contrast it with other other faiths. Um, there's also issues for Sikhs in the diaspora when it spreads around the world. It's hard for them to assimilate, right? They can't cut their hair. And in some cultures, that's very um, difficult for them, for men not to cut their hair. Uh, how they're supposed to bring up their children within the faith. Uh, wearing a sword, that's pretty problematic, um, especially when they're traveling. So sometimes they have to wear miniature swords, like a symbol of the sword, not an actual sword. Uh, and since September 11th in the U.S., um, many Sikh men and who wear a beard 
are often mistaken for Muslims and have become targets of hate crime, right? So I have a picture here of some uh, law enforcement personnel walking outside a Sikh temple in Wisconsin where a gunman uh, killed six people and wounded four others in 2012. Um, at a Sikh temple, and it's believed that he was, uh, you know, he was he was out of hatred for Islam. He mis he uh, thought they were Muslim, and that's what that's what happened. So again, I mentioned that the scholars and internet bloggers still debate the Dasam Granth and whether it's authentically authored by by Gobind Singh or, or some of the other saints, and uh, also they debate some of the. Uh, the festival dates, right? They, they, they have different calendars. That's another sort of inside debate within uh, Hinduism is, is when you're supposed to celebrate, you know, certain uh, uh, birthdays of the gurus and certain events and Diwali and all this stuff. Some go by the lunar calendar, some by the solar, some like a mix between the two. So again, all of this stuff, maybe if you're interested, if you're following the Sikh, if you know, one of my students is doing the Sikhism unit and you don't know what you're going to write your paper about, maybe you can help me out and make me a better teacher by teaching me something, you know, you have to write, if you're one of my students, you got to write one research paper. You got to write one where you debate a controversy, right? You talk about something controversial within a tradition, like, you know, different interpretations of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Last Supper, maybe, right? Like between Catholicism and Protestantism. That would be a debate, you know? And, or you, in the last paper, right? So the, uh, sorry, I'm like losing track here. Research paper, debate a controversy, and um, what am I forgetting? Oh, compare and contrast, okay? This could be your research paper, right? I'd really, I'm actually kind of like, um, maybe in a way I'm sort of appealing to you, please do this for me, for my sake. I wanna be a better, better, a be, better, no, I wanna have better knowledge of Sikhism and maybe you could maybe do a research paper on this, some of the controversies with Sikhism or uh, one of the gurus or something like that. So anyway, sorry, I keep rambling on. Um, I'm done with all the really important juicy stuff, all the stuff you need to know to get a good grade on the quiz uh, in Sikhism. So thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. Glad you're here. And next tradition that we're moving on to is Shinto. We're moving on to a new unit. We're gonna look at religions of the Far East. Okay, so China and, and the Asian Peninsula and you know, and some of the, the, Saba, the Pacific Islands and, and, and Japan and all that stuff. So Shinto's the, the, the ancient religion of Japan. We got a lot to cover in that video. Probably just take one video to go through that. About the same length as this one. So be looking forward to that. Probably be posted later tonight. Uh, again, thanks again for sticking around. Hit subscribe if you want to hear more stuff. Check out my other videos. And I hope to see you on the other side. Cheers.